Welcome to our course in church history. I'm Dr. James Miller. In this course, we'll do a sweeping exploration of the last 2,000 years, looking at how the church interacted with the cultures and nations around it. We'll see how the story of Jesus grew from a small rural population in the Middle East to a global phenomenon welcoming billions of followers today. We'll discuss the early foundations of theology, mission, and martyrdom that laid the foundation for the church in the first five centuries, culminating in the life of Augustine of Hippo. It might be a surprise to some, but we'll discover that the church laid the foundation for the arts and the sciences that exploded out of the Middle Ages. We'll then follow the reformers through a season of upheaval and war that changed the face of Europe. Christianity was a significant voice in the shift to modernity, and we'll see that it remained a countercultural voice in the 20th century through the development of post-modernity, answering a bleak and mechanistic worldview with a promise of hope and love. Church history is the story of God's ongoing interactions with his human creation, a fascinating, passionate, and sometimes embarrassing look at the people of faith. I'm Dr. James Miller. Welcome to Church History. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, we basically have no money for these videos. Augustine of Hippo was one of the definitive voices of history. That's not just of church history, but of European history and world history as well. He shaped and influenced early philosophy, asking some of the questions that Rene Descartes would reiterate, ushering in the period of the Enlightenment. Augustine's greatness lies in part because he was simply a brilliant mind, but also in part because of the milieu and history in which he landed. He lived between 354 and 430 AD, in between the period of the end of the persecution of the Christian church by the Roman Empire, a period in which the Roman Empire blessed the tolerance of the Christian church so as to allow it to spread throughout the Roman Empire, and before the fall of the Roman Empire. Because of his place in history, he became a definitive voice in some early conversations about Christian theology. His reading of the Apostle Paul through the lens of Platonic philosophy would define the vocabulary of Christian theology throughout the Middle Ages. And indeed, for a thousand years after him, if anyone in Europe read anything, they read the Bible and they read Augustine. Leading up to Augustine's life, there had been an ongoing, off and on again, persecution of the Christian church. Nero began persecuting the Christians around 65 AD, purportedly tying them to the stake and lighting them on fire to light his gardens at night. At the end of the first century, Domitian would continue the persecution, requiring citizens to honor the emperor, burn incense to him, and declare that he was lord in order to receive a mark that allowed them to buy and sell in the marketplace. By the 4th century, Diocletian ushered in another period of persecution, and this would have shaped the early years of Augustine's life. But in 313, Emperor Constantine passed the Edict of Milan, a document which said, we don't know which God's up there in heaven, and just in case the Christians might have it right, we'd better stop persecuting them. That's not word for word what he said, but you can read it online. It is very much to that effect. Christians then began to openly gather to discuss the issues of theology. The Council of Nicaea was a defining gathering in 325 AD, where the teachings of Arius were finally put aside, uh, though Arianism continued to hold sway into the life of Augustine. So these are some of the prefaces to the life of Augustine. And of course, he lived before the fall of Rome. He died in 430 as vandals were literally attacking the city. And later in 476, Rome would finally fall. Augustine was born to Monica, a Christian, and Patrick, an atheist. He was born in Thagaste, a part of North Africa that was akin to the Bible Belt in the United States. There was a devout, robust Christianity practice there, one that was common among the peasants. This was actually a turnoff to Augustine in his early days. He saw Christianity as a religion of simpletons, and given that he had a bright philosophical mind, he was not attracted to it. His mother was persistent in her preaching to him and her prayers for him. Augustine, in what would later be his autobiography, The Confessions, tells the story of his youth in which he went to a garden and stole fruit, stole pears, simply to steal them, just because he enjoyed the thrill of doing what he knew was wrong. In The Confessions, Augustine uses this to talk about the fact that we are, from our birth, born sinful. 
Sin is not a pattern of behaviors that we can turn off and on again. We are born with an inclination to do wrong. There's an intentional analogy to the Garden of Eden in the story of the creation in Genesis, where Adam and Eve are in a garden and eat fruit that has been forbidden for them. Uh, Augustine recounts his own childhood in which he takes fruit forbidden for him because it was the property of someone else, which he then went and threw to pigs simply because he could as he grew up, he advanced in the study of rhetoric. He moved to Carthage, where he became a great student and began a study of Platonism. He quickly took to Platonic philosophy. The best way to discuss the reigning debate in Greek philosophy in the ancient world is to look at a painting by Raphael uh, in which he portrays the School of Athens. In the School of Athens, you see a number of different philosophers portrayed but the image focuses in on the center point where Plato and Aristotle are in a debate. Plato looks upward towards the heavens. Plato believed that truth emanated downwards from a, a unified whole, a, a form, a defining force, a logos that gave reason to everything. Aristotle believed that what was to be known was to be known from the natural world. And if there are any unifying concepts that hold categories together, it's because we look at the data of the sensory world around us, the world that we perceive through our senses, and from there, aggregate descriptions of it in categorical terms. Augustine would fundamentally side with Plato because Platonism sounds more akin to Christianity here. There's a God up above, and all truth emanates downwards from God. And if there's any truth to be known in this world, the manifestations of truth are shadows of the one definitive truth that is God. Augustine would be attracted to a kind of Neoplatonism in his younger years that would later shape his reading of the New Testament. While at Carthage, he took to a kind of philosophical syncretic religion that borrowed from a variety of different religions. It was called Manichaeism, based on the name of the founder, Mani. It was a dualistic religion that made fun of literalism and believed there was a cosmic battle between good and evil. Augustine found this much more palatable than the Christianity of his mother in his childhood. While there, he took a mistress, a woman whose name we've never known. And he seemed to be wrestling with religion because he says that at one point he prayed, Lord, make me chaste, but not yet. He was chasing the desires of the flesh and the success and achievements of the world. In his confessions, in the very beginning, he will name this. He'll say, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you, O Lord. And Augustine certainly had a restless heart. In his younger years, he chased after what the world had to offer. Monica, his mother, went to a local priest in tears and asked the priest to pray for her wayward son. The priest told her not to worry because tears such as these are not wasted on God. That would turn out to be true, and Monica would see it as she would pass away a year after Augustine was baptized sometime later. In 375, Augustine moved to Rome, continuing to climb the ladder of success as a professor of rhetoric. Now you have to understand, rhetoric in the ancient world was a premier subject. Rhetoric was what you wanted your child to learn. If you were a Roman father raising a son in the empire, you wanted to train him in the art of public speaking so that one day he might be perhaps a Roman senator or a person of influence, that he'd be able to influence the Republic. And so Augustine becoming a professor of rhetoric was a position of great prestige. In 384, at the age of 30, he became a professor in Milan. Milan, because of its centrality to the political world of Rome was a position of high esteem. The fact that Augustine landed this position at the age of 30 shows how well respected his intelligence was by those who knew him and those evaluated him at such a young age. Fortuitously, it was there that he met Ambrose of Milan, a man who came to be his spiritual father. He describes Ambrose as a friendly man and whose friendship attracted him. But likewise, he was attracted to the brilliance of Ambrose. Ambrose himself was a powerful speaker. And Ambrose's metaphorical interpretation of the scriptures was attractive to Augustine. Augustine struggled with stories like the story of Adam and Eve, which he took to be metaphorical. And Ambrose confirmed that one could take stories like that to be metaphorical without losing the heart of the historicity of Jesus. In 386, he read the life of Anthony. 
a story of an early monk who went out to live aesthetically in the desert and wrestled with demons. And seeing this great spiritual life, Augustine must have felt some kind of emptiness because he came to a point of despair in his life, as he describes in his Confessions. He says as he sat alone in a garden, wondering about the meaninglessness of his life, he heard children singing a song that said, take up and read, take up and read. And he opened in a Bible to the book of Romans chapter 13 at verse 13, which says, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. He became a Christian in 386, and in 387 he was baptized by Ambrose alongside his son, Adiodatus, a son who was born of one of his concubines. The next year, his mother, Monica, passed away, satisfied that the prayers over her young son had been fulfilled. In 391, there's a story that he was ordained a priest against his will. Stories like this were not entirely uncommon in the ancient world, that someone would resist the position of a local priest, but the people demanded his leadership so strongly that he had to give in. Then just a few years later in 395, he was made the Bishop of Hippo. In 398, he would write his Confessions. The Confessions is not just an autobiography. Certainly in the ancient world, there were already evidences of autobiographies, largely of emperors extolling their own virtues and accomplishments, detailing all the military conquests they had achieved. Sometimes people would write biographies of great men, great emperors, but it was always to capture the things for which they were most praiseworthy. No one had ever seen a book like Augustine's Confessions, where he goes through the story of his life and talks about how poorly off he was, how sinful and broken, the kinds of wrong things he did as a child, and how that drove him to a point of despair where he turned to Jesus. The Confessions would then shape not only the history of theology, but the history of writing. Centuries later, Jean-Jacques Rousseau would write a Confessions, intentionally hearkening back to the Confessions of Augustine, though instead of admitting to the original sinfulness of humanity, Rousseau would say that humanity in a natural state is better off. Two years later, in 400, he would write what's called the Rule of St. Augustine. This is a guide to the monastic life. In it, he prescribes poverty, chastity, and obedience. That's governed the lifestyles of monks ever since. Martin Luther in the 16th century, the great reformer, was an Augustinian monk, and there are Augustinian monasteries in the world today. The Rule of Augustine is still a good read, and it shaped the formation of other monastic rules. Between 400 and 410, he wrote a book called On the Trinity, reflecting on the great doctrine of the Trinitarian nature of God. There's a legend that uh, one day he walked down the beach thinking about the Trinity, and he came across a little boy digging a hole in the sand. And he asked the little boy, what are you doing? And the little boy said, I'm going to dig a hole, and I'm going to put the whole ocean inside of it. And Augustine said, well, you can't do that. The hole isn't big enough to contain the whole ocean. And the little boy said to him, well, isn't that what you're trying to do? Get the doctrine of the Trinity into your mind, though your mind is too small for it. It was around this season that Augustine involved himself in two of the big theological controversies of his life. The Diocletian persecution, which happened right at the end of the 3rd century and the beginning of the 4th century, Diocletian's rule ended in 305, saw the, a number of pastors surrender the scriptures over to the governing authorities for fear of being tortured. There was then a, a movement by Donatus to insist that only clergy that had made, remained pure and resisted the temptation to surrender the scriptures, only such a pure Christianity was a valid Christianity. And those who had been baptized by pastors who had lapsed needed to be rebaptized because the clergy was no longer valid. Augustine would argue definitively that the validity of the sacraments does not depend on the clergy. In 347, Donatist had been exiled by Emperor Constans, but the debate continued into Augustine's life. So around 400, Augustine would write a number of letters and seven books against the Donatists. He'd also enter into a debate with Pelagius, who insisted that there was no original sin and that humanity could actually choose constantly to do good. The Council of Carthage in 418 would condemn Pelagianism. 
In 426, Augustine would write the City of God. Rome had been a meritocracy that extolled the virtues of its leaders. It said that Rome was blessed because its leaders had been so virtuous and so good and so powerful. Augustine said, in fact, that Rome was not just, that Rome was corrupt, and that it was a contrast to the city of God, a picture of the heavenly realm. In the city of God, Augustine would argue that part of Rome's failings was that it had not acknowledged Jesus when he walked among its empire. And later when Rome would fall in 476, it was Augustine's condemnation that would sway the Christian audiences that would read his works. In 426, likewise, he would publish his Retractions, where he would go back through the writings of his life and attempt to amend doctrines on which he had changed his mind. One of the most significant was the doctrine of sin. Early in his life, he had believed that a person could choose to do good and turn in direction of the good. Later in his life, he decided that people could not, that as a result of our fallenness, we could never of our own volition choose the good. Augustine contributed to a number of meaningful doctrinal conversations. Concerning the doctrine of creation, he believed that creation happened all at once, and that the six days of creation portrayed in the scripture was simply metaphorical. He believed that the soul and the body were each an independent substance. Substance here is an Aristotelian term referring to a thing in itself that's distinguished fundamentally from all other things. The soul and the body are different substances. The body is extended, and the soul governs the body by reason. When you read Descartes' epistemology, you see how Augustine influenced him. In terms of the problem of evil, Augustine walked hand in hand with Plato. Evil is an absence of the good. It's a failing of the good. It's a turning away from the good. It's not a thing in and of itself. Evil results as a consequence of the fall of Adam and Eve. As a consequence, we are born into original sin. We are born broken. Original sin is an important doctrine to understand if we're going to understand Augustine. The idea is that sins are not a list of bad behaviors that we sometimes turn to. Rather, it's a state of brokenness into which we're born. It's like the difference between a car that rolls off the assembly line and drives out and gets in an accident versus a car that rolls off the assembly line and can never start because its engine was built wrong. Augustine says that humanity is like the latter. We're built wrong. We roll off the line broken. We're born broken. We start off with an inclination to do wrong, and we can't fix it of our own accord. That's the doctrine of original sin. Because of Augustine's younger exploits, the Christian church had been shaped by Augustine's view of sexuality. He believed that sexual expression was for procreation and marriage, and he opposed abortion. His anxieties about sexuality would shape the Catholic church in many ways for centuries. He believed that in the end, grace saves us by pre predestination and sovereign choice. God chooses who will be saved. We're not chosen through God's foreknowledge of our potential for goodness. Rather, God simply wills that some would be saved. Here, Augustine never quite goes as far as Calvin and describes a kind of double predestination where some people are simply designed for hell. But it's hard to get around the implications of Augustine's doctrine of predestination. After about 412 AD, Augustine would reject any capacity of free will to do right. Augustine would craft an early just war theory. In fact, his writings on the just war theory would govern even secular writings about war today. He would say that while it is inappropriate for a human being to pursue violence for their own reasons, when a Christian serves in the military and acts out of the guidance of the governing authorities, He's doing his job, and thus he is allowed to do violence for the sake of the greater good. Augustine would say, in general, Christians should be pacifists, but when serving in the military, which he said was permissible, they're allowed to carry out their orders. If you listen to debates about pacifism and just war theory today, a lot of them are still debating about Augustine. He opposed slavery and said it was contrary to the will of God. In that way, Augustine as a Christian, was very countercultural to the nature of the Roman Empire. And finally, when it comes to the philosophical writings, especially at the end of the Confessions, where he begins to talk about the nature of time, his writings on time were praised by Bertrand Rustle and Martin Heidegger in the last century. His speculations about time being a created thing and God existing outside of time would shape the way great philosophers would think about time many centuries and even millennia later. Again, it's impossible to understate the power of Augustine's writings. 
Augustine shaped the history of the church, he shaped the history of Europe, and he shaped the history of the world. Great thinkers in the Christian tradition have always gone back and read Augustine, and our vocabulary has fundamentally been shaped by him. When we read the Apostle Paul talking about things like salvation and justification and grace, they are fundamentally now intertwined with the way Augustine read those words and taught later audiences to understand them. Some would criticize Augustine for importing Platonic philosophy into Christianity, but there's no doubt that Augustine understood the scriptures well and meant to be faithful to them in his own theological writings. And thus it's true to this day, Augustine is a worthwhile read. I hope you go and explore Augustine yourself, and God bless your studies.